You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Have you ever swam in deep water? Not 10 to 15 feet deep, but deep water, where you look down and you see the light trying to punch its way through, refracting, stretching, and reaching until darkness and the deep take over, and you get this quiet, unsettled fear of what is beyond where the light can reach. The water to the people of the ancient world was always a symbol of chaos, the unknown and uncontrollable power, and it was feared. They lived with this balance between needing water to sustain life, and water being the place where the great deep waits in the darkness, a place where the great creatures of the deep roam. And yet in the deep, God has redeemed. Over the chaotic waters, God's spirit has hovered, and within the waters, God has worked. There's a theme in scripture that I want to go into with you. A place where there is life, chaos, cleansing, depth, fear, and sustenance, which all matter to God. Because what God loves, he puts into the water. Well, good evening, Foundry Church. Good evening, Foundry Church. (laughs) Invitation for response on this Beautiful, beautiful fall night. Thank you for the honor and privilege of being able to be back here with you this evening. As um, Justin said, my name is Phil. Tonight we uh, dive in, bad dad joke right there, we dive into Into the Water Part 2. Central question tonight that I want us to get our minds around. When it comes to stubbornness, what is the one thing you will not do? For example, at work today, this literally happened just a few hours ago. The guy next to me, at in my desk, he's, he's, he wears the Michigan jersey, and I knew this was going to happen. And I had to come in today, and I had to say words that I never thought I would have to say. And I had to acknowledge to him that his football team, at least this year, was better than my beloved Spartans. And those words were so hard coming out of my mouth. Because you know how Michigan fans are. No, just kidding. <laughs> just, just kidding. He's... He's here tonight so I can make fun of him. When it comes to stubbornness, what's the one thing you won't do? For some of you, you know in your home you're the designated spider killer because everyone else in your home refuses to kill spiders. They are that stubborn about it. Maybe it's something involving your health. Maybe it's a certain food that you just refuse to eat. My mother tells a legendary story over a standoff on a plate of green beans when I was a child. And it's that parental standoff where you know, like, you can't leave the table till you've finished. And uh, and she calls it a standoff. I call it a war of attrition. And hours later, that's right, hours later, I won, and so did the dog who ate the green beans. I can dig my heels in with the best of them. So I saw this billboard the other day, and it actually was like calling me out on my stubbornness. It actually was kind of a little bit... Uh, insulting to a small degree because I was like, I I was kind of bristling at the response. I was driving one day and I saw this billboard and it said this, this year thousands of men will die from stubbornness. And my initial response was like, how dare you tell me what I will or won't die from? You know, pot's calling the kettle black already. As a stubborn man, I'm like, you don't get to decide that. And I'm bristling, I'm pushing back on it. And I wouldn't normally advocate for graffiti from the pulpit, but there is a man, has to be a man, there is a man after my own heart because I drove by a few weeks later and I saw this. And I was like, woo! (laughs) Amen, brother! No, we won't! You know, like, there's that stubborn streak, right? And so I thought, man, after my own heart right there, I don't know who that person is, but they get me. Because if being were stubborn was a varsity sport, I probably would have started as a freshman. If it were an Olympic thing, probably not gold, but I'm at least, you know, I'm probably going to get a bronze or maybe a silver. I can dig my heels in with the best of them. And there's that thing about stubbornness. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. There's always that one thing that you just know you will dig your heels in and you will fight over it. And so tonight... What I want us to wrap our minds around is that God has a heart for spiritual people because maybe we could rephrase the question as we think about stubbornness. Maybe we could just add one word to it tonight. 
Maybe this could be our, our focal point. When it comes to spiritual stubbornness, what is the one thing you will not do? Because Foundry Church, I believe that God has a huge heartbeat for stubborn people. And I think whether you describe yourself as being innately stubborn like I am, I think there's a part of us that bristles when God offers us something. So tonight we're going to ask that question. When it comes to spiritual stubbornness, what's the one thing you won't do? Throughout the scriptures, you will find God describing his people and the authors of scripture describing his people as obstinate, as stiff-necked, as hard-hearted. And so we resonate with that, that there's this God that's calling his people back to him. And tonight, to do that, we're going to look at a what you might consider a somewhat obscure story found in the Old Testament in 2 Kings. Now, before we just drop ourselves into the story, I believe context is important. And, uh, and so I want to be good students of context tonight. And so I want to just kind of unpack where this passage comes from. And I hope this chronological flowchart will help us make a little bit of sense of where we're at in the story. So let's take a quick flyover and spend just a few minutes of figuring out the broader context before we look at this story of a military general who when God places restoration and healing right in front of him, he bristles and recoils and does what I do and digs his heels in. So before we dive into 2 Kings chapter 5, a little bit about 2 Kings. 2 Kings originally was a part of 1 Kings. They weren't written as two separate books, so it's important to kind of look at both and at the same time. So when 1 Kings open, it opens with Solomon at the helm in chapters 1 through 11. And you may remember Solomon as being the son of David and known in biblical lore as the wisest man of all of time. However, as Solomon's reign comes to an end, it actually takes a nosedive and it starts to go downhill pretty quickly. Solomon, for political alliances, starts marrying these women of these rival competing foreign countries. And not only does he bring these women into his marriage, but he brings their faith and their gods, lowercase g, into his life and into his kingdom. And so infidelity certainly wouldn't, fidelity certainly wouldn't be the word we would describe as first kings talks about Solomon and his rule. Now, this may be an oversimplification, but we're trying to go quickly. The kingdom falls apart shortly, shortly after Solomon's rule, mostly because of greed and lust for power, but it splits into two kingdoms, and it splits like on the brink of civil war type split. Not like, I mean, there's a lot of animosity. This is like on the brink of war, and there's two kingdoms now. Israel becomes the northern kingdom with its capital in Samaria, and Judah becomes the southern kingdom with its capital as Jerusalem. Now, the book of Kings, obviously, what's the, the topic? The topic is kings. So it, it basically reads like a who's who of good kings and bad kings and wicked kings and faithful kings. And if we were to look at Israel in the northern kingdom over the course of 18 to 20 generations, they were batting 0 for 20. Big fat goose egg. They had zero good kings over that 20 gap, 20 generational gap. Judah, the southern kingdom, a little bit better, but not great. Scripture describes basically what is eight good kings over that 20 generations. And so again, you start to see the dysfunction and the political dumpster fire that is happening now to the people of God as their kings lead them astray for lust of power in, with injustice and infidelity to Yahweh. Now, despite the shortcomings, despite the political dumpster fire, God is always wooing and coaxing and calling back stubborn, obstinate, stiff-necked people. One of the primary ways God in this time was trying to reach his people was through the prophets. So by the time we get to 1 Kings 17, all the way through the start of 2 Kings, it's dominated by this prophet known as Elijah. And Elisha had a fire in his bones. This guy is what I would call the watchdog of the covenant the covenant of God, the, co the covenant God had made with his people all the way back to Moses and Mount Sinai. And Elijah was that covenant watchdog, just barking every chance he got, telling the people of God to stop their idolatry, stop the injustice, and return to God. And after Elijah was the mouthpiece, this prophetic voice to the people of God, he passed the mantle literally onto Elisha. In 2 Kings 3 through 8, we see the rise of Elisha as the watchdog of the covenant as the next major prophet 
to the people of God, calling them back to Yahweh. And 2 Kings lastly ends with exile. What do I mean by exile? Well, the people of God were under attack, under invasion, and when these countries would invade, they would not only take plunder, not only ransack money, animals, anything of worth, but they would also take the people back. And so you start to see this happening as 2 Kings goes on. The Assyrians were the ones raiding the northern empire. They were the ones actually physically deporting, trafficking people across borders and making them slaves. And then as 2 Kings comes to a close, we find the Babylonians exiling the southern kingdom of Judah away, not only taking their valuables, but removing them into forced captivity. So I believe context is important. So where do we find ourselves tonight in this story of 2 Kings? Well, to backtrack, we find ourselves in this time when Elisha is now the prophetic watchdog, when he's the one trying to call the people of God back. And so I want us to narrow in now onto this story. And like I said, it's a maybe it's an obscure story. If you weren't raised in a church, maybe it's a story you've never heard before. But I think it's a powerful story that illustrates God's heart for stubborn people. So, with that being said, let's dive into our story, into our sacred scriptures, into 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to go through verses 1 through 15 this evening. Opens with this. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy, leprosy being a very debilitating skin disease. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives, there's that forced exile I was talking about, among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. Now, again, who are these Aramean raiders? We're not talking about the Aramean football team. The Aramean raiders, again, Aram is a province in modern-day Syria just to the north of Israel. So when it's talking about the kingdom of Aram, we're talking about an Assyrian province. We're talking about an Assyrian nation-state. And when it's talking about the Aramean raiders, it's again talking about that precursor to when the exile is happening. We are already seeing the people of God being exiled out of their country. Now, why is Naaman important? Well, two things. He's a mighty general, which means basically he's second in command to the king. If you're a, a film buff and you're a Russell Crowe fan, you might relate to the character uh, from Gladiator of Maximus Aurelius Decimus. And that might be a good illustration of somebody who's very close to the king and has had major uh, fame and battlefield valor and is basically this conquering celebrity now of the ancient world. So we know Naaman's important because he's second in command, but he's also pretty famous as it comes down to it. Let's pick up the story. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying his gifts, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter I present my servant Naaman, and I want you to heal him of his leprosy. Now something strange is going on here because things just got political, and like bureaucracy today, a whole lot is lost in translation. So imagine this scene. Naaman actually has the courage to return to a land that he's just conquered, to take the advice of a slave girl that's now working in his home, to go to a land, to a God he doesn't believe in across political boundaries. It is a very strange context for this story, is it not? And the king gets involved and he's going to send a king, he's going to send a letter to the king of Israel saying, I want you to act on my general's behalf. Send him with a big bag of cash and some clothes for the journey and let's see what happens. So when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, Am I God? that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? 
And immediately, like bureaucracy today, so much just gets lost right away. And I think this is one of those no-win situations politically. Imagine if you're the king of Israel. You already know you can't defeat them in battle, and now you have a request to heal leprosy. And he's probably thinking, this is a no-win. This is a really strange ultimatum. You either want me to defeat them in battle or heal leprosy, and I can't do either. And if I don't heal him, are you going to attack again? And that's almost exactly what he says. The king replies, the king of Israel, I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. Talk about adventures and missing the point, right? But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. And again, you don't believe that prophets have a lot of moxie? Look at what the prophet says. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. Now, a little theater of the mind when we read this. He went with his horses and his chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. Picture this scene, would you, Foundry? Picture this scene. This is a conquering war hero celebrity with an entourage, right? And he's traveling across borders because he's just desperate enough to seek some help. And he shows up at the prophet's house, and I would imagine, speculation on my part, I would imagine that this is some ramshackle, backwoods, like biblical glamping type, type scene where it's, you're just, it's so backwoods. Like the prophets weren't living in luxury. And so he arrives with his entourage, and he has great expectations. And watch what happens next. But Elisha sent a messenger out with him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. So what have we learned? Not only do prophets have a whole lot of intestinal fortitude, uh, but they're also a little bit rude. What does he do with his celebrity guests? It gives him the intern treatment. He sent a messenger out. In other words, he sent his servant out. In other words, he sent the intern out. He gave him the runaround. He didn't even go out to greet him. And the intern goes out and he says, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River and watch Naaman's response when healing is placed in front of him. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over my leprosy and call on the name of the Lord as God and heal me. Great expectations, right? I wonder how many of us have been in that same position where we could have said, I thought God would and fill in the blank. Naaman goes on to say, but aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farpar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. And again, I find myself in this story, in this context right away. I can identify as that person going kicking and screaming when things haven't gone my way in my stubbornness. Like, like this horse that's led to water that refuses to drink. Here's Naaman, and I see him, and he's just like, everything's wrong about this story. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? Thank goodness the entourage is with him. So you should certainly obey him when he says, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself in seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And as I'm imagining this scene playing out, I'm imagining Naaman, have you ever seen that guy that he's just always muttering something under his breath and he's always grumpy and crabby? And and I would imagine like he's always like, when you see him walking with his wife, he's always 10 feet behind his wife and he's like, I'll leave the toilet seat up if I want to leave the toilet seat up. And he's just all, like I imagine this is how Naaman's going into the Jordan River. Stupid backwoods prophet of Israel and mystic. You know, just grumbling, complaining. Like this guy's not rushing into the Jordan, right? He already thinks that the rivers where he's from are so much better. But he does it. He does it, right? After putting up this fight, after stalking away, after digging his heels in, he actually goes in and something happens. 
His skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. And Foundry, what we see here going on is what God continues to do. He shows up in the middle of our mess, and something miraculous happens. And it's not a miracle based on physically entering the Jordan River. The miraculous wasn't the waters of the Jordan. The miraculous was God, again, stepping into our mess and redeeming and doing what we can't do. And so when I think about this story, like I said, I find myself in this, in this story. It, it felt so of God to, when I saw that this was the story for this part of the water series. I'm like, oh, of course, God, you want the stubborn man to preach about the stubborn man. I get it. <laughs> but while there's so much that's going on here, what I love again is that this is all about restoration. This is all about God doing what we can't do. And as Eric said last week, what God loves, he sends into the water. Even a military general that had conquered his people, he sends into the water. And like I said, there's so much that jumps out at me at, about this passage. But I think so many of us have been in a similar position, right? Where we've stalked away, where we've gotten angry, where we've been the horse that's been led to the water. And we've refused the gift staring us in the face. And I don't know what it is about me, and I don't know if this applies to you too. And I don't know why I would rather fight God for something he is freely giving me. And there's this weird spiritual dynamic in place where it's like, why would I rather fight you than accept your generosity? And I don't honestly have a good answer to that. But I do want to continue to look at God's response. Because basically what we see, here's Naaman's response. Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said this, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So yes, there is a breakthrough. There is this moment, this aha moment where he stops the fight. But here's the thing. When you look at the story in its context, what was keeping Naaman out of the water? I think it was this. It was the wrong place. It was the wrong way. It was the wrong person. What did he say? Well, the rivers where I'm from are so much better than your filthy backwoods Jordan River. Wrong place. Wrong way. What did he say? Oh, I thought he would come out and wave his hand over me. I thought there'd be pomp and circumstance and fireworks and bells and whistles going off. Thought it would happen this formulaic. If I do this and this and this, then God certainly will do this. Wrong person. He expected the prophet. And what did he get? He got the wingman. He got the intern. He got the runaround. And I think so many of us in our spiritual journeys, if we were actually to analyze them, we'd probably find a lot of truth in our own stories that it was God used the wrong place, the wrong way, and the wrong person, and yet somehow here still we are. So what's your Jordan River? What's the spiritual thing? When it comes to spiritual stubbornness, what is that one thing that you refuse to do? Is it forgiveness? Ouch, it, it, hits, it hits home, it hits hard. I understand that there's such a thing as generational unforgiveness. It's one of the hardest things. Is it ever trusting a church again? You all made it here, and maybe for you that was your Jordan River. Maybe just showing up at church again was like, maybe there was a fight in your heart and in your soul just on the way here. You're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not going back to And you turn and you stomp back into the house, and then you're like, fine, I'll go. I don't know why I'm going. I don't even want to go. Maybe there's some truth to that, that even just getting back into this place was a fight with yourself. Maybe it's belief that there is a God in the first place. Maybe it's belief that there could actually be a God who has hope for you. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's not even something as big. As, maybe it's just something where you've dug your heels on, on something as simple as, should I join that small group? Should I get involved in this? Should I fast? Should I get engaged again in church life? I don't know what it is that you've dug your heels in. But I want you to know so desperately what God's heart is for us stubborn, obstinate, stiff-necked people. I actually heard a story that when I heard it, I was like, it was on a podcast and the guy wrote a book, but I'm like, oh, that's so Naaman-esque. When I heard it, I was like, 
oh my goodness, this is like modern day parallel of what was going on with Naaman. So I briefly want to share the story with you. It's of this man, Christopher Yuan. And in the late 1990s, Christopher was an aspiring dental student at the University of Louisville, like very promising dental career. And he was on the brink of graduation, but while by day he was a, a dental student, by night he was living a double life. And he was living wildly and recklessly as one of the premier drug dealers in the gay nightclub scene. So mired in sexual sin and substance abuse, these two worlds finally caught up with him. And they collided, and he was expelled from dental school with just four months to go. Now again, if you've been to church, you're like, and that was the moment, Phil, that he hit his knees and found the Lord. Wrong, it wasn't. That was the moment when he doubled down and decided to go even deeper into sin. He was expelled from dental school, and he moved to Atlanta and completely immersed himself in the gay community, especially the bars and the nightclubs. And this is what he said. I began doing what I knew how to do well, drug dealing. He was jet-setting off to Miami and to New York and having multiple sexual encounters and just bankrolling like a rock star. He said, I was a superstar and I felt that I was invincible, that I was like God. Now, Christopher's parents, heartbroken, basically describing like what they felt was the loss of their son, were still praying for their son every night back home in Chicago. And they refused to give up on their son. And they actually went down after he was expelled from dental school. And they went to visit him in his apartment in Atlanta. And Christopher wanted nothing to do with his parents. And basically, they came and they tried to visit. And he basically kicked them out. And his dad, in this moment of like heartbreak and desperation, was like, Son, can I just leave you the family Bible? Can I leave you my Bible? In this hope that maybe his son would just, just maybe, just maybe read it. And Christopher actually was like, um, one, get out, and two, I don't want your Bible. This was that moment where you're like, oh, maybe this was the breakthrough. And Christopher said he actually took his father's Bible and he dumped it into the trash as soon as his parents were out of the house. But his parents kept praying for him. And one day, his mother said she went to her prayer closet and she prayed one of these dangerous prayers that parents often do. And it said, she said, Lord, have mercy on this son. Do whatever it takes. And the answer to her prayer came later on Christopher's apartment door down in Atlanta. And he said it was 12 federal drug enforcement agents and two German shepherd dogs. And they said as he opened the door, they could see the street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana on his counter. And when the door is open, that's a pretty incriminating sign right there that you may be dealing drugs. And he was sentenced to 10 years to life in federal prison in Georgia. And Christopher said at that moment, his life fell deeper into despair. And you're like, and that's when he took, no, still no. He didn't turn to God at that point. As he tells the story, though, one day he was in the prison cell and there was a common space and he was walking around the common space and he actually saw a trash can as he tells the story. And he said, in that moment, he said, this was the most apt analogy for what his life had become. From something of worth and promise and potential to garbage to trash. He goes, I just literally felt like trash. In a strange twist of spiritual irony, because I think God has a sense of humor, there was a Gideon's New Testament Bible on top of the trash. Now again, crack in the door, maybe, but Christopher said he picked it up only out of sheer boredom for new reading material in the joint. He said that was the only motivation he had at that moment to actually pick up the scripture. But again, like Naaman, wrong place, wrong time, wrong person, wrong method, doesn't matter. You still see God at work in it. Fast forward. So he takes the Bible just for reading material, but it's a start. A few months into his sentence, he was actually handcuffed and he was in another facility. And he was handcuffed because he was in front of the nurse in the medical ward of the, uh, of the hospital. And the nurse wouldn't even make eye contact with him. She had something to say to him. She had some announcement to give him. And she wouldn't even make eye contact. She wrote down three letters on a piece of paper and she just slid it across without even looking up. And it said HIV. And Christopher was HIV positive. And if he thought his life felt like trash a few weeks before that, he said now he felt like he was living with a death sentence. So he went back to his bunk and lying on the bottom of his cell, you see these at anywhere like... If you've ever been to summer camp and you look up and people have 
written messages on the bottom of the bunk. However, in prison, there's a lot of vulgar and profane comments, as you would expect. But one comment was etched into the bottom of that metal bunk, and it said, if you're bored, dot, 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 which normally is not an invitation to something holy. However, in this case, it was. It said, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong person. Somehow Christopher searched for another Bible. He said he miraculously found one in the midst of a stack of styrofoam plates and cups. And as he read that verse in Jeremiah, it said, God had a plan for his people to give them a hope and a future. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And now, yes, now here was just a sliver. Christopher describes his conversion as a very slow conversion as the word of God just kind of like the tide, just kept pouring and washing over him. It was that slow and steady, I'm going to fight you every step of the way. It was a kicking and screaming conversion, if that makes sense to you. But it was just one verse from the prophet Jeremiah, and it was just enough on that one day to give him a hint of spiritual hope. And Christopher took that hint of spiritual hope and ran with it. He would go on to finish his prison sentence, getting out early for good behavior, and he would go on to take a deeper plunge into the waters of faith. In fact, he would give all of himself to God, surrendering the drugs, surrendering the homosexuality and the desires to make himself great. He actually now teaches at Moody Bible Institute back in Chicago. He tours the country talking about godly sexuality. And it's an amazing story in part because of God's faithfulness to a stubborn person, but also because it is that slow, kicking, and screaming conversion that maybe you resonate with, and I know I do. So, throughout the scriptures, we find that God literally and metaphorically uses the water. But what are we to take away from a God who calls us when it's not our idea in the first place, or when we're not even looking for God? What do we take away when we just don't even want God, when we're the ones trying to keep him at arm's length. To you, if you are a fellow heel digger like myself, guess what? His grace is just as stubborn as you are. I can't prove that with passage and verse. There's not a verse in the Bible that says God's grace is stubborn, but here's what I would offer you as proof. If you want to go down this road with me, do a study, would you? Google it tonight. Find out how many times In Scripture, we read that God is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Just do that search. Type in slow to anger and abounding in love and see what happens because you will find this oft-repeated phrase all throughout the narrative of Scripture describing God's heartbeat for stubborn, obstinate people. Every generation said it. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Do you catch the juxtaposition? Slow to anger. He knows stubborn people and abounding in steadfast love. What I take away from that Foundry Church is that he doesn't just match our stubbornness pound for pound. He matches it and then overcomes it with this stubborn, scandalous grace. Do you know why Christians for centuries have sung about amazing grace? It's because when his scandalous, stubborn grace meets our resistance head on, like I said, it overcomes it. Scripture puts it very clear. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, while we were the ones digging our heels in, he was the one choosing to freely offer us grace when we defied him. In our rebellion, he chose mercy. In our obstinance, He chose grace. In our stubbornness, he beckons us with open hands. He says, come to me. I don't care if you come kicking and screaming. Come to me. Take that step. So some application for us tonight. Taking that step is incredibly hard. If you could identify one of those things that you were spiritually stubborn about, let's just be candid and honest. It can be a really hard thing to take that step, especially if it's something you've dug your heels in on from one stubborn person to another. I get it. God gets it. I think it takes a whole lot of courage and it takes a whole lot of guts. And if you can identify that thing in your head that you've dug your heels in, can I just give you some encouragement tonight? Maybe you're going to just dip your toes in 
Or maybe you can take that running leap head first into the waters. When I was a scuba diver, we had to, to get certified. We had to do this thing called buddy breathing, and it's all about dependency on, on someone else. So what would happen is you and your partner would be in the pool, and your instructor, our instructor would come up behind us, and he'd either rip the regulator out of your mouth, or he'd just shut the air tank off in the back. Either way, the two of you had to get to the surface by sharing one tank and by passing the regulator from person to person. It's an incredibly unnerving experience, actually, because you realize in that moment, even though you're still in a pool, that your life somehow hangs on the balance, and there's vulnerability, and there's trust, and there's just this moment where you're like in absolute dependence on another person. And so you're supposed to slowly rise to the surface. He takes a breath. You take a breath. Go up a few more feet. And you're just buddy breathing. And it's this, this incredibly vulnerable position to be in where literally you will not have breath in your lungs if you are not in tandem with that person. And as I was thinking about God coaxing stubborn, rebellious people back to him, I kept thinking that God is trying to do something similar when he leads us into the water. He leads us in there to restore us back to him, but it looks like dependency, it looks like vulnerability and it looks like simple trust. And I love the fact that it was all too simple to name and right? Like he's like, really? All I have to do is get in this river? He's like, I thought it would be much harder. But I think even though it takes guts and it takes vulnerability and it takes courage to take that step, I think it's still sometimes just a simple step because his grace rushes to meet us. I oftentimes would tell people that if there was a hundred steps between you and God, I honestly believe, Foundry, if you are willing to take one, I believe he's going to take 99. I think if you'll just take the one, I think he's going to rush to bridge that gap. I think that dependency is going to lead us into restoration as we take that step into the water. So this week, this month, the rest of this year, my courage to use, if you could identify that thing, and like I said, maybe it's something as simple as, will we join the small group? Or maybe it's something bigger. Will I actually believe that there's a God who loves me? Will I actually maybe trust him again? Maybe will I actually pray again? Maybe will I actually take that step in obedience on that, that, that sin that I've been coming back to for decades that I've just refused to ever give back to him and, and let go of? But I believe Foundry is going to keep calling you. Even you heel diggers. He's going to keep calling you. Sometimes it'll take weeks. Sometimes it'll take months. Sometimes it takes decades. But I don't believe he's going to stop trying to bridge those 99 steps to try and get to even you. So what's your Jordan River foundry? Because what God loves, he sends into the water. So maybe this time, maybe this time your toes will actually hit the water. Let's pray. Father, I can confess and we can confess that it's oftentimes it is kicking and screaming how we come to you. Oftentimes it looks like the wrong place, the wrong time, the wrong person, and yet you still use all of those scenarios in your efforts to call your people back to this amazing covenant that you've let us be a part of, where we get to be your people and you get to be our God and we get to call you Abba and Father and we get to find restoration and healing as we set foot into your waters. So Father, give this place, give the Foundry Church courage to not want to stay the same, but to take that step. Based on the prompting of your Holy Spirit, would they take that step and just trust that you are going to rush to meet them? Would this be a time of transformation as their toes hit the water and they sense you in that moment, in this journey, calling them into a deeper faith, into a deeper love, into the deeper waters of who you are? So do what we can't do and rush to meet us right where we're at. We love you. We thank you that you will bridge any gap that we have between us. And we thank you for your faithfulness to stubborn stiff-necked, hard-hearted, obstinate people. In your son's name we pray, amen. As we close Foundry Church, I need to preface what I'm about to say by saying I like cats, I really do. But have you ever tried to give a cat a bath? That moment where it's 
all of its limbs are somehow outstretched like go-go gadget limbs and it's like climbing up your face and shredding your neck because you're trying to get this thing into the water and you got to hold it out like this. And then you get it to the edge of the bathtub and all of the limbs are like grabbing for the edge of the tub and you're like, I can't get this cat in the water. And as I was thinking about two images of trying to get into the water, there's, there's the cat and there's me that's kicking and screaming and fighting God every step of the way. And a couple of years ago, uh, we were at this celebration of new life in Christ and there was this profession of faith moment where these adults were making profession of faith for the first time. So there was an adult baptismal pool and it was right at, off the stage. And most people were very modest when they entered the, the baptismal waters and they would kind of take a couple steps over the ladder and ease their way in. But there was one guy, God had changed him and there was new life and there was healing and there was restoration and he saw the baptismal pool and bless his heart, he took a flying leap and did a cannonball into the baptismal pool. And we were like, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. He cannonballed into the waters of faith. And I'm like, why am I the cat? Why am I doing this move when I could be doing the cannonball? And that's my prayer and that's my encouragement that like you, that this might be true, exactly what Naaman said in 2 Kings 15 Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And that would be my prayer for you, Foundry Church, that you would know that there is no other God who calls you into the depth of his love and into these waters of peace and restoration and forgiveness and mercy and stubborn, unrelenting grace. So go in that grace, Foundry Church. Have a wonderful week. You are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.